we can dive right in to hear all your stories. Um, we'd be here for days if I told them all. We can do part two, three, and four. A series. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the Week in Hustle podcast. Today we have a legend in the house that I'm so excited to chat with. Connie Combs is here today to discuss all the stories that she has in her years of barrel racing. So to get started, Connie, I always love to hear the background, like what led you here? So it's true that you won an NFR at 18 years old. So can you tell us just a backstory of really what led you down the path to barrel racing and to the NFR at that age? Um, how I got started was my dad, he, well, when I was little, I just liked horses from the time I was, I think, born. And mm -hmm. so my dad, I got my first horse when I was eight and it was a young horse. So he didn't know anything. He was bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. He was a pain horse named King. So I rode him till I was 12. And then my dad got me another horse and he said, um, this will be a step up horse. It's a runaway race horse. OK, so I'm like, what is a runaway race horse? He said, well, when he doesn't win the race, he goes through the center of the track. I'm like, well, how am I supposed to get him stopped and turned? He goes, well, you have to figure that out. <laughs> so I did. And then uh, then I got my next horse. His name was Maudie's Joe. I can. He's the one that took me to the next level. Um, and I was only 16 when I got him. And was I ready for him? Apparently so. I think this was all a God, a God thing is what I say, because I'm like, this doesn't, he was only three when I started him and I was only 16. So we were both pretty young, even though I'd rode the other two bad horses before. Mm -hmm. And I kind of knew how to deal with problems. Um, when I got him, he was really, he knew how to run. My dad goes, you know, my dad always said they know how to run, put the turn in them. So always had me good horses that knew how to run other than my first one and I had to like teach him everything but um yeah and then I started him on the barrels and then in 90 days he started winning at three and I'm like okay I knew right then he wasn't a regular horse even though I was young mm -hmm. and my dad told me he goes this horse is going to take you where you want to go he goes so we're going to just start out easy with him he's only three we'll just start out easy of course maturities they didn't have that going on then they were just starting um, but I was more interested. I was in high school rodeo. I started out in 4-H, but at the time I was in high school rodeo, but I did get my permit for my pro card and I filled it pretty quick. Wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. So yeah. all horse training aside, which we'll get into, and I'm excited to hear that story. What was it like when you got that horse or just knowing that, Hey, this horse can take me somewhere and I guess even like stepping up into that position of like, Hey, I'm going to get my pro card and like finding kind of like that alignment to do something like that. Like, was it just something that you felt like, yep, this is my next step and you just went for it. Or what was that like? It was actually my dad. He said, we're going to get your permit and, and take this horse and see how good he does. Yeah. And I'm like, you mean I got to go run with the pros? I'm like only 16 years old. <laughs> I've only ran in high school rodeos in 4-H and, and local play days, Jim Connors and stuff like that, you know, yeah. some for the fun yeah. of it. But I was always competitive. Like I, I never liked to lose. So I did mm -hmm. have the competitive side there. And then my dad, he just more or less said, we're just going to enter a few rodeos close. We're not going to go too far, kind of see how this horse clocks. And he, he started clocking and he kept clocking. And then I was living in Louisiana at the time. So we moved back to Oklahoma in the summer and, uh, in the spring I was running him and down in Louisiana. So he knew what mud was. I had to train him in a lot of adverse conditions. He didn't mm -hmm. have the perfect, everybody wants the perfect ground these days to train in. Well, there was no perfect ground down there. There was grass, water, mud, mm -hmm. whatever you could find to ride in. So then I just, we moved up here and then we started going to some pro rodeos in Oklahoma, North Texas, kind of in that area. And I knew mm -hmm. that was going to step it up a notch because I'm like, okay, there's tougher runners in this area. Mm -hmm. you know it's always kind of been known for barrel racing and so that's what I did I started entering a few pro, rodeo, pro rodeos around here and then my mom came up late summer and then we went ended up going to one in Coffeyville, Kansas Vanita Oklahoma and I, I won I won Coffeyville placed at Vanita but again it was nothing but mud it rained the whole time and I think that's why he did good and I did good because I trained him in the mud so mm -hmm. it helped to have again the adverse conditions I trained in helped me win when I had to deal with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a couple things yeah. like I did see one of your posts just talking about having a horse in adverse conditions. So what do you really think uh-huh. the benefit is and how could someone if they do like if they have a nice arena like what could what could be an example of getting them more exposed to these adverse conditions that you're talking about? Well, like if you have an outdoor arena, um everybody wants to ride in covered indoor arenas with the perfect conditions, right? You need to go get an outdoor arena. And sometimes not work your ground so much. You know, everybody thinks, oh, it's got to be worked constantly and smooth. And years ago, the Yuris don't live too far from me. And, and I would go down there and ride with them. Some I went to a couple of their summer camps with Florence. And and they would have ruts around the barrels. And they were like, you know, these horses have to learn how to handle that. You know, mm-hmm. don't go out there every time there's a rut and smooth it out. Make them learn how to stay in the ruts. And that's kind of an old rodeo saying. I heard John Ferris say years ago, stay in the ruts and you won't have a ground problem. If you get on the outside of them, you're going to have trouble. So I would just listen to little things like that from different people and go, hmm, that's interesting. Stay in the ruts, Mm -hmm. you know, don't get on the outside of them. When it rained, I didn't look for a reason not to ride. I go, okay, I'm going to go get get in the mud today, you know. Or sometimes you leave the water sprinkler on and you make a big mud hole because sometimes when you run at a rodeo, it's pretty dry, but sometimes between the barrels, it's not. Mm-hmm. So you have to teach your horse how to go through all that. So I just say go out and ride when the weather's not so good, when it's a little wet and muddy, a little windy. You know, not when it's dangerous, but just don't make life. So, like I heard this doctor say not long ago on the radio, he goes, don't make life so easy. Park as far as you can out in the Walmart parking lot and make yourself walk. Don't look for the closest spot. And that's true in horse. Uh huh. Yeah, and that's true in horse training. Don't look for the easy way out. Go look for the toughest things you can ride in, and mm-hmm. and go ride in those things. Yeah. yeah. This is yeah. a uh, we're calling out all the fair weather riders who are like, which I honestly am kind of guilty of too. Sometimes where it's like, oh, it's a little like because I'm in Canada, yeah. so it might be cold and raining and like just windy, and it's like, ugh. But it's true if you really want to get that competitive advantage, and I guess that is also partially what determines the winner versus someone that maybe isn't willing to do the work. So that's kind of a question for yourself. It's like, are you willing to go that extra mile, maybe literally yeah. at the Walmart parking lot, right, to really get right. that that drive? Because it really does, I think. And I mean, mm-hmm. you do talk a lot about mindset, which I would like, I want to get into for sure in a bit. And yeah, like just the idea that it all starts as well as outside of the arena that- mm-hmm does it does yeah. it's like my dad told me he said if you see the trash needs to be took out take it out I don't care if it's somebody else's job just do it because that's going to make you a better person you know if you, if you see something needs to be done just do it because that's going to make more of a champion out of you instead of well I don't want to do it because that's my mom always told me that's going to be a reflection of how you ride you know yeah, yeah. Say that. I, I love that. you didn't like slamming cabinets um, if you slammed the door or anything like that, you were in trouble. You had to do things soft and easy. She said, that's how you're going to ride your horse. If you're rough away from that horse, you're going to be rough when you get around it. Mm-hmm. So we, so I had to be like soft and easy with everything. Yeah. Even even though I did have a temper and I could be a brat sometimes, mm-hmm. I had to learn how to deal with it myself or go somewhere else and be a brat with mm-hmm. myself. I mm-hmm. couldn't do it around people because... Mm-hmm. My mom and dad, lots of discipline, yes. Mm -hmm. He was a drill sergeant. My mom, she was real strict on, um, she liked horses to stand and kids that didn't mind, she go, they need to just go to their room and stay for a while and think about what what they need to do in life. And another thing she told me was, you're not going to really start rodeo until you're 18. She goes, you don't need to be a child doing this. You need to grow up first and then get into the adult world. She goes, because children, when they're too young, they get confused. And so she wouldn't let me do anything too young till I got, I know 16 sounds young, but they were just letting me taste it a little bit, but they really didn't let me go till I was 18. And then she was with me the whole time. Yeah. 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 Cause I did really want to ask the influence your parents had on your riding. Cause you did mention them quite a lot. And I think that's yeah. awesome. Like the support and the lessons they gave you for that example, though, like just of 16 verse 18, what do you think the difference was for yourself? Because now there's like young riders out there under 10 that are on these powerhouses of horses. So for you, oh, what was yeah. that experience? Like, like that, that age gap of 16 verse 18 for you? Well, when I was 16, you know, I mean, you're kind of starting to grow up. You're not so much a child anymore, but you're still not really ready to make a lot of decisions. And, 
I don't think you're really ready to get out into the adult world. My mom always said, if you do it too young, you're going to burn out. And as you get older, you can have a lot of problems. Like sometimes you see that in childhood stars, you know, Mm -hmm. when they're, when they're great as an actor, when they're younger and as they grow up, then there's a lot of temptations that come there. But I think it's from 16 to 18 and 18, I made better decisions. I think I rode better. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I wasn't relying. I couldn't rely on anyone else to make sure my horse was OK. I had to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, as a kid, you're going to get your parents. Hey, we're going to do this, this and this. My parents said, told me you're going to have to win if you want to do this. and You're going to pay your own vet bills, your own expenses, because we're not going to do it. So I knew then I'm like, OK, I got to step this up a notch if I want to haul. And I've got to win because I can't haul. And so mm-hmm. then I was able to take that kind of pressure. And so nothing was handed to me. And so my parents, as a kid, when I did the play days, I mean, you're talking about small entry fees, not a lot of investment. But my dad told me, this is kind of like a business. It's an investment. He mm-hmm. said, and you're going to have to make it work or you can't do it. So it and most everybody you used to see at a barrel race, at a, at a major rodeo, you knew that they were there because they were winning because no one had enough money to just go blow it to say, hey, I entered, right? You knew when your competitors were there, you had to run tough because they were all winners. And Mm -hmm. so you're like, oh, I got to step this up a notch. So I was also able to handle the pressure better. And I was able to handle the wins better just from 16 to 18, because through that from 16, 17 and 18, I felt like I was developing a lot Mm -hmm. to be able to handle more adult things. Whereas at 16, I'd have been a lot more emotional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just yes. like you said, the lesson of your mom of acting more gracefully in everything you do, probably by the time you're 18, you're understanding that a little bit more or actually like feeling yes. that a bit more. So I would yes. love to talk a little bit more about that just because I fully believe like who you are as a person does reflect your performance. Not always, it seems like there's always those people that win and you're kind of like, what? But I really do uh-huh. think like how how you show up or how you just show up with life in general affects and shows in your results in the arena. So can we talk a little bit about that? Oh, it definitely does because you got to, you, you know, winners, everybody knows you got to be a little bit arrogant to win. You got, mm-hmm. because that's making you, that's like you're believing in yourself, mm-hmm. but you got to be humble and you got to be nice. Mm-hmm. And I tell everybody, you're only as good as the horse you're on. So if you're on a top notch horse, you're going to look really great. But then when you don't have the top notch horse, you're going to look like the horse you're on more or less. So they're going to mm-hmm. humble you out pretty good. But yeah, when you go out in the arena, um, yeah, you should just, I always pray. I always have a lot. So I always need God's guidance. Cause I'm like, sometimes I don't even know what I'm doing. And mm-hmm. always my biggest fear is I always go, I hope my horse doesn't forget the pattern. Right. Mm-hmm. And everybody's like, what? And I go, yeah, sometimes you have that self doubt, but I think that's what makes you better. Because you don't go in there and go, oh, I've got this one. Because no, like my mom always said, there's three barrels to turn, and until you get around that third barrel and you're and you do it really good, you don't have the barrel race one. Because you see those people that get around the first two really good, and they like I got this one, and they quit riding, and then they screw up the third barrel and cost mm-hmm. themselves the barrel race. So yeah, I think the person that you are outside the arena is going to have a big reflection of what you're on the inside. Mm-hmm. Like take Lane Frost, for example. He was a great person in and outside of the arena. We all have our flaws. We're all not perfect. But it's so much better if somebody's going to be a champion and a winner if they're happy and they mm-hmm. and you help other people and you talk to other people and you inspire them because I think this is all about inspiring others. Totally. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, like I was kind of told where also your wins, like if you're a kind person and you're almost doing it, not necessarily just for yourself, but like you said, as almost inspiration of showing people that the right way can win, like doing it kindly and correctly and authentically, or just with kindness and love up front that that can also win as well. And I think that is great that when you inspire those people, you're not just winning for yourself at that point, you're winning for others and people really like to feel that connection and, you know, like showing other people what's possible that, Hey, like you can do it this way and you can win doing it in a nice, kind, gentle, like pure hearted way. I want to talk about, you just said how self doubt helped you. Can you explain Uh that a little bit more? Um, I think, I think we all have a weakness. 
Um, a lot of people don't want to admit it. But yeah, sometimes when you have self doubt, it makes you, I think, step up to the next level because you got just, you got enough fear. And my son loves boxing. And so a lot of the boxers always say, turn fear into fire. Okay. Mm -hmm. So before you go make that run, of course, it's normal to be nervous. And the better horse you're on, the more nervous you're going to get because you know, this horse can really clock and I better not screw it up because yeah. notice I say, I better not screw it up. The horse is going to do a good job. I got to stay out of the way. Yeah. And so, yeah, that self doubt sometimes I think makes you keep that edge on you to where you, where you compete better. If you just mm -hmm. go out there and think, well, I got it one and you get arrogant, you don't have mm -hmm. that edge on you. So at that point, I think you lose a little bit of what you need to win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I like that. I have never heard it quite in that way before. So I think a lot of people, myself included, feels a lot of doubt with my ability or what I'm doing. And I think that is like you just said, it is a good thing because then you're able to know that, hey, I don't have all the answers. Like I don't know everything. I don't have this barrel race one. And then you're able to, like you said, kind of dig in something inside of you to show up and really perform knowing that, hey, like, we don't know exactly how this is going to go. So I love that. Um, yeah. I'd love to talk a little bit about your experience, like going to the NFR. So just to kind of backtrack a little bit to you turned 18 and then now you're experiencing what it's like at the pro level. Can uh, we hear a little right. bit about that? Well, I'll just say the first year that I went professional full time, um, I turned 18. Well, I turned, I'm my birthday's in June, so mid mid year I turned eighteen. So I was still seventeen when I started my NFR year, and um, I went to Denver. And of course, it was a snowstorm, and my mom was with me. And it took us thirty six hours to get to Denver, mm -hmm. and it should have just took like twelve, right? It, we got an ice snow, and nobody really knew weather forecast. Just went out and go, okay, we're going to go to Denver, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then you run into a little bit of snow, and before long, it's your in major ice and snow, and so. Again, adverse conditions, but we made it. I won some money and stuff like that. So my next one's going to be San Antonio, Texas. I'm like, okay. I placed at Denver. A lot, of, you know, a lot of tough stuff going on. Made the short go, but I pulled through it. Now I go to San Antonio, win that one. Go to Baton Rouge, Phoenix. I'm, you know, I'm winning all them. Then all of a sudden, I hit a cold streak for about two months. I mean, I can't win anything. It's like, how do you go from winning everything to winning almost nothing? Right? This horse isn't firing something's off of course nobody really knew what injections were but my mom did massage therapy a lot we had a great horseshoer and we got his blood count checked the way he was bred he was very um fine. Uh, he was double bred joe reed is what he was and so when you line breed like that you can have a little bit of things that get a little off well his was his blood count would get low and i didn't know that so we took him to the vet got a checkup he said let's check his blood work because this vet was kind of a racetrack vet Sure enough, his blood count was low, so we he gave him some a couple of shots, and we could put him on some just red cells, something like that. And before long, he got back to clocking again. And so nobody had ever told me nothing about that. So that's something that we went through. And then as the year goes on, I think my scariest rodeo was Cheyenne. Even though I'd won a lot of major rodeos, I never will forget the morning at Cheyenne. And I'm like, I hope he turns the first barrel because I'd heard these horror stories. If your horse has been on the track. It, since the first barrel sets by the track, they're going to see the track and they're going to run off, right? Well, you hear this and you're like, I wonder if my horse, again, self-doubt. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was the third runner that morning in Slack at 8 a.m. And I thought, you know, I've just got to give, I trust my training. That was what Wanda Bush, she was a great barrel race. Trust your training. I remember, I'll never forget, they called my name and I'm like, oh no. And I'm like, I got to go. I didn't want to go, but I had to go. And I went out there and I won the go around when it was all over. I just gave, I said, you know what? I'm dropping my hand and I'm just giving it to him. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. We went out there and ran a pattern basically without me. I say getting in his way. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say I didn't do anything because I stayed out of his way. So that's doing a lot. Because oh, I yeah. think most barrel racers get in their horse's way. The last words I told myself when I made that run was stay out of his way and give it to him. And that's what I did and won the go around. I went, that wasn't hard after all. So mm -hmm. then I ended up making the NFR that year. And I'm like scared to death again. My first run and I run like a second off and my horse pulls the shoe off. And I'm pretty upset. My dad goes, we'll get the shoe on. It'll be okay. Second round, I placed. And after that, I placed in all the rounds, ran the fastest time, the most money, the most go rounds. Starting out, my first round being basically a disaster. But I knew, again, I had to put that behind me and focus ahead. I have nine more runs. i got to focus on 
doing mm-hmm. good. In the, I'm not saying winning the next nine runs, but I've got to try to place and do the best I can in the next nine runs. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Awesome. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. I love that story. There's a lot yeah. that I want to talk about, just even the idea of what you said in Cheyenne of trusting your training and also not getting in their way, which you said is very hard for barrel racers. So what are some, some things like with the trust aspect, how can we gain more trust? What does that really look like and feel like for you? Well, basically I think people, um, a lot of anxiety, keeping anxiety down. People have anxiety at the clinic. We were at Tucson this weekend. I asked everybody, you know, there's like, say, 20 girls there. How many of you have anxiety? Every one of them raise their hand. I'm like, oh, gee. Okay. Mm-hmm. First thing you got to do is breathe, stay calm, stay relaxed. My mom always told me, stay calm. It's okay. And just the her saying that to me helped me a lot. She goes, mm-hmm. that horse knows what he's doing. You've trained him really good. So you got to just leave him alone and let him do his job. So having someone on the sideline like that, a coach, that that's that, you know, so my mom I mean that's the best coach in the world I totally trust her and mm-hmm. just hearing those words there like I, I'd ask her you think I can really run against the pros well yeah you're as good as any of them are even though they're not treating you the best in the world and they're not being nice to you because you're winning she mm-hmm. goes you're as good as any of them are and I'm like yeah that's true you know so she kept that that confidence instilled in me. You got to have somebody to keep the confidence built up. And I think when you you have the confidence, it's going to feed over to your horse. Mm -hmm. If you lack confidence, that horse is going to lack it too. So Mm -hmm. it's going to, it's, it's a team thing that you got to do for that horse. Train them correctly is the main thing too. I see a lot of people they're struggling because they're, they're in the horse's way. They're over training. I'll have to say the horse I won the most on probably trained me. I got I just showed him what I wanted, stayed out of his way, and he showed me what I needed to do. Mm. And that's what I did. I said, I don't really need to be doing that much. He, This horse, I'm going to ride him like he's out in the pasture. I'm mm-hmm. just going to show him what I need, stay out of his way, and let him do his job. And mm. that was probably the best thing I told myself because at that point, he, he wasn't a horse that you overbent in the neck because if you did, he was going to swing his back in. He ran pretty straight. You just turned him with the reins and let him do his job. And he was actually that easy to ride. Most of the horses I've ever won on have always been that easy to ride. If they're hard to ride, I know I'm not going to win that much on them. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that. I like that analogy. And I think I, I relate a lot to your training style. Like I remember seeing your article in the, or the barrel horse news magazine, and I didn't clue in until I connected with you now that that was your article because uh-huh. it's been out for quite a while. And that really shaped a lot of my riding style of it can be that simple and like the straight lines, the square, just the approach and just really keeping it that basic. So circling back to just saying how people overtrain, what, do you think that looks like like how would you describe overtraining or overriding versus maybe your method of teach them the job and you said like they almost your horse almost taught you what it needed in order to do the job right so what are the differences um the difference is um in this day and time on social social media you see so many training videos by the time you're done watching them all you're like how do I need to train right yeah. so you need to like not not do too much of that. You need to find somebody that you can work with that that'll give you that good set of basics that you can put on that horse. And my dad stop straight, back straight, make sure you got good lead changes and make sure you can move the horse's hip. If you need to make sure the, the hip follows the shoulder and the shoulder follows the nose. That's all I basically do. I see so many people. They're like over bit. They've got them so broke down. They look like a Western pleasure horse. And God didn't create horses to travel like that. So they're they're not really broken the pole. They're broke over in the neck. And so when they're broken, the, when they're given in the pole and they break over in the pole, they're just kind of given through their jaw. And mm-hmm. so you pick up and you feel them just give through the jaw and their neck kind of stays straight. It doesn't come up in the air. And it doesn't go down. It just stays level like out in the pasture. So I see everybody doing too many reverse arcs, um, too much lateral movement. The horse's feet get tangled up. That disengages the back end. Now all the weight's to the front end. Then they say the horse is pulling, so they overbreak the neck more to get more control. Um, I don't like split reins. My mom, if I'd have rode the split reins, she'd have took them off and whipped me with them. Said, we're not in a Western <laughs> pleasure class. She goes, 
You need to practice like you're going to compete. You don't train one way and then ride another way when you compete and then blame the horse for it. So my mom, even at the NFR, she would grab some of them horses from the girls when they were mad and go, the horse didn't do it. You did it. Now you need to go sit down and think about it. And I'm going to hold your horse and you need to go calm down and think about your next run, what you need to do different because the horse didn't do anything you didn't tell the horse to do. Another thing I see when they do the reverse arcs, they crank the neck and the nose too close to the shoulder, and then they take the spur and stab the horse. Yeah. At, I, at that point, I would love to do that to someone. Let me like vice your neck down and then spur you in the rib cage and tell me why I would even work for you. I, Ray, there was some someone of Ray Hunt, Tom Dorrance, one of those guys said, if a human did that to me, I would turn into the biggest, I'd be the bronc of the year in rodeo. And that's kind of how I feel. I just turn into a bronc and go, there's no human going to ride me and torture me like this. Mm-hmm. And another thing, when you crank on their face that much, the jawbone, my dad taught me, a horse has the bars in their mouth. That's where there's no teeth, that open space on their bottom jaw. He said, if you pull on that and you bruise it up and get it tough, you have nothing left in that horse. So he taught me to pick up, pick up to the upper jaw because he said, you can't pull on it and hurt it. So when you pick up, you're only giving that horse a cue. You're not pulling, you're turning them on a cue. Mm. And so that's basically how I've always been taught to train a horse. Pick the inside rein up. They set the inside hind leg, they shape up underneath you. And then they'll tell you how much nose they need to give you, or they may not give you a lot of nose, mm-hmm. you know? And yeah. so, yeah. So mm-hmm. it's a lot, would you say of, cause I really like the idea of kind of, you can teach yourself, like you can learn the basics, but then after that, I got caught up in a situation where I tried to ride like other people and learn their method and apply that. And I think I was skilled enough of a rider to do that, to be like, oh, I see what you're doing. I'm going to mimic you. And then I had all these issues because I really didn't understand the philosophy. So I had to backtrack a lot to learn what worked for me and like learn my style and it sounds like you're kind of agreeing with that or like the same idea of keeping it that simple and also being able to kind of like self-teach yourself a little bit and uh do with the horse let the horse even teach you in that regard so you mentioned hand position a little bit I'd love to chat a little bit about that I never really thought about the whole like lifting versus like the roof of their mouth Uh versus the bars so when you are let's say and I love that you said it's more of a cue than a pull and I think that's so key for people. So can you break that down a little bit of what it's what you look for versus maybe what you see in other riders? Well, I think the biggest thing at the clinics that I struggle with is people pulling back all the time, looking down, pulling back, holding their inside leg into the horse, slumped over. They don't carry their own body weight. When you're riding a horse, you've got to carry your own body weight. If you're just plopped down in the saddle pulling that horse's back is going to get so sore just from you setting on them all the time. And so I teach at my clinics, when you stop, breathe up. And when you breathe up, that takes the weight off the horse's back. They lift their belly, they lift their back, which that's working the top line. And then they drop their hocks. And so they learn that as you're going in the barrel, when I pick, so I take my thumb and I always keep my thumb up. And so I pick up and I say, it's kind of like you're getting a little scoop of ice cream. You just flex your wrist a little bit. That horse will feel that little cue there. They'll set their inside hind leg and they'll you'll feel them soften their rib cage up and you're not having to stab them with a spur and crank their head and mm-hmm. get their feet out of balance. Because if you get their feet out of balance, then the horse is going to start a fight with you. Then they can't turn. They get on the front end. You got a bigger chance of falling down and just getting strung out all the way around the turn. So I basically have the barrel pattern set up. I tell them at the clinics between the barrels. It's like a racetrack. When you go in the barrel, you shape them up like a barrel horse. You pick up get their nose a little bit, very soft. Um, You'll feel them give that inside hind leg. Then you keep the shoulder and hip in line. Then when you get to that backside, you get parallel. You're almost setting them up like a cutting horse, going to turn back and catch a cow. So now you're turning into a game for them. So you get parallel on the backside. So they set their inside hind leg up underneath them. That's going to bring the shoulder up and set the inside hind leg to keep the collection there to drive them through the backside of the turn so you have the power coming out. Mm-hmm. So you go from, uh, and then, so the backside would do about a fourth of a roll back. So all it is, you, I actually I just turn backs, what I'd say. So I go on the barrel, race horse, barrel horse, cutting horse, then a fourth of a turn, like a reining horse. Mm-hmm. So you have four disciplines in less than a second to do. It's and I've true. learned all that. And I learned all that basic style like that from horses. I'd ask people 
And by the time I get done talking to a person, I'd be so confused. Like you say, I wouldn't even know how to ride. And if you ask 10 different people, they're going to tell you 10 different ways. And I'm like, there's got to be an easier way to do this, especially when I'm fixing a problem horse. I can't fix a problem horse, bending them, flexing them, running them sideways. So that's when I started out with the squares. And I know squares have been around forever, but not so much in barrel racing. When I started teaching it, I taught it because I had to fix a problem, a blew up maturity horse, basically. That if you even thought about bending him, he would completely blow up, rear up, run off. So I said, we got to fix this horse. And everybody's like, well, squares have been around forever. Yeah, but nobody ever told me about it in barrel racing. So I thought, we're just going to ride straight lines and kind of make a square around the barrel for right now. Then we'll start putting that other method which people don't realize I, I go from the square to the barrel horse, cutting horse, reining horse turn. So I, then I break the square down into those three methods and I always work them on a diagonal on the outside front leg to drive the inside behind them. And so when you're doing the square, there's a whole lot more to it than just making a square because mm-hmm. there's different setups for the turn and footwork you got to do on the horse to have that square and those points that you're hitting. That's correct. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. It is a lot. I would say just, again, kind of like what you just said, there's a lot more than just a square. It's kind of like the intention behind it. Same as let's say a counter arc, like maybe there is a time and place to do a counter arc, but it's like, but what is your purpose with it? And does it align with what you're actually doing? Like you said, cranking their head, spurring them. Does that actually align with what you're actually trying to accomplish? And to me, like, I wouldn't be able to find an answer. Like I would be like, probably not. And to me, why I really enjoy your training style is that it makes sense. It's simple and it makes sense and it's just user-friendly. So going to the squares, how did that help your futurity horse? And just even getting a blown up horse in general, like you said, you had an off the track where a lot of people in my area for sure get off the track horses. So what is that like when you get a horse that's maybe in that state, what's your process to get them just going better? Yeah. So this girl had come to a clinic and this was a blew up futurity horse. He was very small, 14 hands quick and catty um a lot of people told her well you might as well give up on him she paid a lot of money for him they you might as well give up on him you can't fix him well she come to my clinic i said look it's going to take a year to fix him this isn't going to be no overnight fix i said the first six months we've got to basically start over with him because this horse was so locked up in his hip and when i say when you'd even think about getting any nose on him he would lock, take his hip and push it to the inside, lock his hind leg up. That's when he was going to rear with you. Okay. Mm-hmm. I said, first thing we got to do is unlock his hip and his hind leg. And he's got to find out when we ask him to give to the bit pressure and, and just give his nose a little bit that he doesn't have to go into panic mode because to him, that was a, a bad thing. Mm-hmm. To him, that was, oh, I'm fixing to get pulled on. This is not going to be fun. I hate turning the barrel. He'd get to the barrel. The anxiety on this horse was unreal. He would come in the arena, rear up, strike at people. Um, we ended up doing an article on it in the quarter horse journal a few years back. And we ended up getting that horse fixed, lots of straight lines, um, teaching him to give to the bit in your hand, start out with the ring bit, give his nose to the inside, move forward in your hand, work on the diagonal, move your hip, go forward. And when you move the hip, it's only about two steps to teach him to give the hind leg and then go forward immediately when you mm-hmm. give me that leg. That got him out of the rearing up. The way I get a horse out of rearing up is I got to get their nose move their hind leg two steps to the, just a little bit kind of under into the side. When I feel that second step give, then I can push them forward. Then the hips unlocked. So mm-hmm. horses wear up because when they lock their hip up and they're sore in their hip joint, everybody thinks it's the hocks when it's actually up in that whole hip area. So when that's locked up, you got major problems. So that's what we had to do is unlock his hip, teach him to give in the face, soft to the hand, and then we eventually put him on squares and then I have an obstacle to course that I do at all my clinics. It has a little jump serpentine poles for lead changes, a big square that you'll go around it twice through the center. The big square is going to keep that straight line on a diagonal again. And then you go to, then we have a little barrel pattern set up at the end where you can't get any speed really. I mean, it's only like two strides between the barrels and we do that. I condense that down to really show you where your flaws are in your riding because you don't have time to screw mm-hmm. up in that if you do you're not going to make the next barrel most people come out of the barrel they pull straight back the horse goes sideways well you're not going to get over the second barrel if you're doing that on this little tiny pattern so we break the whole barrel pattern down to the point that it's so easy for the horse they pick it up quicker than the human yeah <laughs> and so then they know where to change leads where to set their hip where to set their hind leg once we taught this horse that he picked it up 
he just kept completely made a 360. He's like, oh, this is easy. It doesn't hurt. And I understand mm -hmm. what you want. Before it hurt, he didn't understand it, and it was hard for him to do. So, of course, he's not going to run the barrels good if he's got those three things going on that's not good. Yeah. And, and you just know, we see, and we see all the winning runs, and we're like, oh, I want to do that. Well, to get those winning runs, you got to stay out of that horse's way and make it pretty easy. If you're fighting with that horse, believe you me, your horse isn't liking any any better than you are. They don't mm -hmm. like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a really good point to make as well is keeping that in the forefront of your training and your riding of how can I make my horse enjoy it? How can I make clear communication that they understand and just eliminating that anxiety? So oh, yeah. when you get mm -hmm. a horse like that, what are your, like, what do you think are the reasons that it is caused? Like to get a horse that's just so blown up, like how can we avoid maybe getting a horse and we start to make it not like its job and we start to make it have a lot of anxiety, like how can we reverse those effects or how can we just eliminate them from happening? Well, when I was a kid, if I didn't run barrels good and the problem started, I wasn't allowed to run barrels. My dad made me do a basic running pattern. And that was you go down, you ride, you get on the, on the rail and you ride about halfway around down the arena. You stop straight, you back straight and you stand square for about a minute. You don't move. Then you go to the middle of the arena and you do a couple of circles to the right in the correct lead front and back. Then you break, then you transition down to a trot. Then you'll go to the lope and then you will do two to the left, a big and a little one. Then you transition down Then you'll do two, a straight line to one end of the arena and you stop and you have to do a roll back one direction. You go down the other end of the arena the same way and you do another roll back. That's how I was programmed as a kid. OK, mm -hmm. I say program because it's like you're not doing the barrel pattern if you can't do this basic reining pattern. It's very basic. And if you can't do that with a horse with no anxiety, you're going to sit out here and do this. And when this becomes easy, then we'll go back to the barrel pattern. So the first thing I do if a horse has anxiety is I take them off the barrels and I do basic things with them. Go out and open gates up, not just trail ride. I put a little pressure on them when I'm doing it. Open gates up, move your hip. Set your, move your hind leg under you twice. Go forward into my hand. So I go take all those things I need on that barrel pattern, and I take it away from the barrel pattern, get the horse doing it easy, start out slow. Then I start adding a little pressure to, to that reining pattern, too. I'll start out walking, trotting, loping. Then I'll actually put it into a pr pretty fast pace. And at the same time, this is going to help me bring my anxiety down and make me want to run barrels again and appreciate it because when you – just everything's barrel racing all the time. I don't think you really appreciate it anymore. I think you just thank God that everybody owes this to me. I'm great. And I get this. I'm going to run barrels all I want. No, sometimes you got to take yourself away from that environment and you got to go back to the basics. And I pray a lot too. I'm like, I've helped, helped so many people with so many horses. There were times I was like, I really don't know what to do with this horse. God, you've got to help me with this. And guess what? It may be a week, it may be a month, all of a sudden the answer would come. And guess what? It was so easy because it's like God created them. So why don't we ask him for more help instead mm -hmm. of asking people for help all the time? And he always gives me the answer. Here's what you need to do. You know, the main thing is being, being at peace because my mom always told me all you are around a horse is energy. So where, what, what you come, that energy that you're bringing to that horse is going to be a reflection of how you're going to do. She goes, so if you need to change your energy if you want things to get better, okay? So that that's anger, anxiety, any of that kind of stuff. So she taught me, calm your energy down to get better at what you're doing. She loved the massage therapy. She did that years ago on all our horses. And everybody goes, what is she massaging horses for? Is she some voodoo lady or something? This was long before anybody even knew what it was. And I told her, I said, you need to put a school in for this. But she knew exactly, and she would be out there for two hours. She didn't use no machine. She'd be out there two hours just playing with these horses. And she would do their their hooves, their legs. She would even do their ears, their lips, their mouths. She'd have them breathing so deep and all that bad energy coming out, as she called it, and letting the good energy come back to them to release all that soreness. And she had her little lotions and potions, but well, those horses always ran good after she worked on them. And she'd always make them stand. She always made them do groundwork. She said, if they can't stand at the trailer and they can't stand when you're talking to someone, she always had a little switch too. If they don't stand, they're going to get their ankles cracked, right? And it's like, okay. And that horse would see my mom go, I'm not moving because I know she, they knew discipline, right? Horses know 
if you give boundaries or not. If you give no boundaries, they have none, they're mm -hmm. going to be bad. Mm -hmm. And at the clinics, that's one thing that I have to deal with is I'm like, we're at a barrel racing clinic, but I'm also having to discipline a lot of horses at the same time that people let them just do whatever they want to do. My horse didn't. I said, well, your horse knows you're not going to get them to do it. They know that there's no boundaries. They're just going to do whatever they want. just like a kid in a grocery store. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids act up because there's, the parents have no boundaries for them. So when there's no discipline or boundaries, and I tell people there's a difference between abuse and discipline, right? So you don't go out and beat on a horse, spur them. You go out there and you say, set them in the ground, back them a couple of steps and say, hey, stop and stand here a minute. And I tell people that in a barrel pattern. Anywhere in that barrel pattern, you're having problems, just stop. Get your horse square back on their feet. Get their hip and shoulder in line. Just take a minute. See where you're at. Think about what, what you want to do when you go to your next point of that mm -hmm. barrel pattern, you know, mm -hmm. and that helps people a lot. When I tell them to stop, stand square, we're going to repeat the same thing over till we get it correct. And a lot of times the riders I have to fix because they're pulling back, they're rolling their hip up, they throw their hip to the outside, they drop their hip to the inside, they're looking down, they're giving these horses all these mixed signals and the horse is reacting to them, but people blame the horse and I'm like, you're the one causing it all. So I said, I need to come out with seat zapper. And when you guys sit in that saddle and you roll your hips and get your butt zapped, you'll get back in the middle of the saddle. So many people ride crooked and they don't even know it. It's really sad because they're bending and pulling so much on these horses. They're shifting their weight to the outside, not knowing it. And these horses are tracking that way. They're teaching them how to track that way. But the person doesn't know it. And the horse doesn't know any better because that's what they're being taught. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just amazing. What yeah. people can do and not even know it. Yeah. 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 And uh, I mean, there's lots that I want to talk about with all that you just said. Yeah. Going yeah. to that concept, though, I always believe that my body weighs a lot more than my hand strength. So meaning yeah. like my body's always going to win. If I'm pulling and doing all this stuff, it's like, what's my body actually saying? Because the horse is going to feel that a lot more than me trying to be like, oh, in my mind, when I pick up and do this and ask for all this stuff, I want this response, but to the horse, they're feeling what your body's saying. And I just think it's a good reminder for people again, to have that intention with what their body's telling the horse, because the body yes. awareness is huge. Like you just said, is there any things that we could do just to dive into that a little bit more that when you see someone riding crooked, are there any good tactics that you found helped people to get more understanding of, let's say, even their center of gravity and just staying more centered and aware of how they're cueing their horse with their body? Well, my dad told me when I started out as a kid, he goes, always keep your spine aligned with your horse's spine. So your spine should be centered with your horse's spine mm -hmm. and keep your chin level, your eyes up. OK, and don't be leaning in. Don't be leaning out. I know some people say step out as you go into a barrel a horse is going to pull you to the outside as they're turning. You don't need to be stepping out there and pulling, you know, more weight out there. And when you hit the back side of the barrel, you got to reset your hips. And so if you feel all that weight on that outside stirrup, you're going to have to step a little bit to the inside to center your weight back up. Mm -hmm. So if I feel myself getting pulled in or out, I'm like, okay, spine back centered with my horses. That was probably the best thing my dad ever said. Keep your body alignment correct by feeling your spine lined up with your horse's spine eyes level, chin up, and look between the horse's ears like a windshield. Don't be looking down at the ground. There's nothing there. Mm -hmm. If I want to go keep a horse out, I look to the outside ear. If I want to bring a horse in, I look to the inside ear. If I want to go straight, I look between the ears. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we teach at the clinics. And so if a rider's hanging off to the side and they don't realize it, we'll have to go over there, push their hip back up. They're like, wow, I didn't even know I was doing that. So sometimes you just got to have somebody watch you and help you with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like yeah. that. It's so simple. <laughs> like just even having okay. the intention of where you're looking is so, I mean, we do it without thinking every day, all day, but then having that intentionality to be like, look exactly where you want to go. And it's so subtle, but again, going to like the energy concept, just that energy right. shift of where you're looking, the horse is yeah. like responding. Like you guys are so in sync in that moment to be like, working as that team. And I mean, that's what we want. Like we want that simplicity, but maybe people think it's like so much harder than it has to be. Oh, definitely. Yeah. It doesn't have, and when a horse is cutting in on you, you don't want to pick that inside rein up and look down because 
I tell everybody, what's the first thing a jockey does after they win a race? They stand up and bring the reins up. That tells the horse to quit running. Well, if you're going in a barrel and you're picking that rein up too high, riding with your hands too high, to a horse, that means to slow down. you mm-hmm. got to keep your hands even with their neck and ride like a jockey and be pushing mm-hmm. forward all the time and don't and look to that outside ear because that's going to help keep your body up and centered on that horse. If you pick up and look down and in, and yet drops all your weight to the inside, that horse is going to dump on that inside front leg, all that weight. Well, mm-hmm. now you just like, you're going to soar them up and throw their shoulders out of place. Right. Now you're right. going to have to go to the chiropractor or vet because you just threw that weight to that front inside leg. Now you're disengaging the back end. You're going to throw the horse on the wrong lead in the back. Now they're going to sling sideways. Now you just pop their hips out. Their hocks just got sore. Their stifles mm-hmm. are probably like really hurting at this point, And their back is probably out of place. Yeah. Just riding them incorrectly. And uh-huh. but the biggest thing my mom always said, asked her one time, I said, all the barrel races you've watched, what was the number one thing that you saw? She said, people cutting barrels off. She goes, they will not ride by the barrel. They start anticipating cutting the turn off long before they get there. Then they blame the horse. They're yeah. picking up. They're looking down. Their weight's all, they're leaning in or they're lean, pulling out, you know, and it's like all those things are a big no on a horse. You just Mm got to become a part of that horse and stay centered and ride forward. Right. Yes. It makes sense. Mm So forward momentum and just like what your mom said about cutting them off. So would your fix be just that simply of looking to the outside of the ear, staying centered and driving forward? Um, We have other things we do, like coming off the first barrel. We had one horse last weekend going to the first barrel. He was ducking it. She was running straight at it. A girl told her run straight at that first barrel. That's how he's trained. Well, she would run straight at it about halfway. Then she'd look down, pick up, and he'd duck off. She goes, this is what he's doing. I can't get him to the barrel. I said, okay, we're going to have to do the extreme with you. Uh-huh. You're going to have to look at the third barrel and, right, and look to the outside ear and don't even think about coming across here. And I had a pole set out there a good six or eight foot away from that first barrel. You're going to have to ride toward the third barrel. You're going to have to barely pick up, and you're going to have to ride him this far out on this barrel right now to you break your habit. It's not him. I said, he's going to be pretty, I can fix a horse pretty easy. I can't fix a person as easy. Mm -hmm. So I have to put everything to the extreme with them. So to get her to do that, I had to set that out six to eight feet away from the barrel. Everybody goes, Oh, you got to work in the same spot all the time. No, you don't. The horse is overturning, cutting me off. I'm going to work a bigger pocket or I may not even turn the barrel. I may just, go halfway to it like if they got dog bar in them or something if they get too cowy on me i run them off i'm like now you're not turning you think you're going to turn now you're not turning now mm-hmm. once they think they're going to run off now we're going to start turning again mm-hmm. so depending on the horse i change them up and i then i've seen people at the nfr do that i'm like okay I, one horse was cutting in on the first barrel the girl's running him up pin won't even let him you know turn the first barrel i'm like I wonder if he'll run off tonight no he went out there and turned and gave her the room she needed she had mm-hmm. to run him off to keep him that space to get around that barrel mm-hmm. so we just do different things according to what the horse is doing mm-hmm. the biggest thing i have to do is let that horse know they're not going to bully me because me being on the ground i teach i teach from the ground because my dad told me Wanda Bush told me years ago, Connie, don't get on them horses. They're dangerous. But she got hurt a couple of times. And I said, okay, so now I ride them. I can pretty much ride a horse from the ground. I've rode so many and taught so much and have been taught about horses. I can pretty much watch their footwork and tell you what they're going to do. But mainly the rider, I can tell you, that horse is fixing to do this or that because you just did. They're going to react to you. They react to your reaction. Mm-hmm. yeah so exactly. people tightening up and I said you're going to look at the barrel when you're running that's human nature but when you're practicing I tell them to look to the outside of ear so you're not looking down at it so much anticipating it you're trying mm-hmm. to train your eyes where you want to go mm-hmm. I don't like picking an object out on the fence because that you, you have soft eyes and you have hard eyes to me when you pick something on the fence it gives you a hard, hard eyes and it makes you tense up. When I connect to my horse's ears, I ride the outside ear. My eyes stay soft and I stay connected to the horse because mm-hmm. I'm trying to keep a connection all the time. Mm-hmm. I don't want anything to disconnect or the problem's going to happen. Yeah. I like that. I can even feel the difference in my head thinking, you know, if I had an anticipation problem, go look at the fence and it's like you're so fixated on that, but you're actually missing yeah. the point of the barrel race where thinking in my head right now of looking at the outside ear, it's like, yeah, we're more in sync and we're actually doing the pattern together, not like bracing about an anticipation. 
even looking at defense, you're still going to anticipate. So I really like that. Oh, yeah. Small little yeah. change makes a huge difference of our yes. energy, our intention, how we feel about the thing. And you just said, you know, like helping people is a lot harder than the horse. And going back to the idea of even just stopping for a minute, letting the person maybe yeah. decompress and think about that. What do you think that benefit is? And how have you seen oh. that affect the, the rider? We do that a lot. At, at, at the clinics, we do a parallel stop on the back side of the barrel. Everybody goes, why don't you stop before the barrel? I said, I don't want a horse anticipating. I want them to learn how to set, get their footwork set up and the transitions that they're making the footwork. So I slow their feet down on the approach. Like when I say slow their feet down, low, trot, walk, stop. I let them know as I pick this rein up, I need you to set your feet and, and get them adjusted to where when we go to this barrel, you got that hind leg set on the backside. We do a lot of stops parallel on the backside because that's a hot spot on a barrel horse because they're anticipating turning and running the next barrel. Mm -hmm. The first time we have them do that, they throw a fit. These horses are mad. They're like, why are we doing this? I should be turning and going. Mm -hmm. Horses take three times and they figured out the third time they're taking a deep breath, standing, going, thank you. Even their eyes have less stress. In the beginning, their eyes are so stressed out. They're so tense. But by the third time, the horses completely start changing, going, thank you for showing my rider this. <laughs> and then we show them how to after we stop we always go forward two steps because if you if you turn when you're stopped you're going to swing their butt so i said you got to go forward two steps to get the forward motion back so you can turn the shoulder to drive them off the inside hind leg and so once you learn to feel that you're like wow the horse turned their self at that point because horses work on a diagonal so for me to turn their shoulder if i'm on at the right barrel i got to bring the inside hind leg up underneath them so they can pull their outside shoulder around. And so when I have that footwork correct, the horse is going to turn herself. I no longer even have to pull on them. I just got them with the reins. The reins are just there like a steering wheel on a car, power steering. And I'm barely going to move my hand to get that movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Their ears are the windshield. The reins are like the steering wheel on a car. So with power steering, if you had manual steering, it's a little harder to steer. Mm -hmm. but we all have power steering these days. So it's very, and I tell people to relate it like that. You have power steering on this horse. This should not be manual. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. It's kind of funny, like the car analogies, because some of the lessons I give, maybe you'd agree or not, but I tell people like when they're steering, it's like steer with your hips and it's like your hips are your headlights. So it's like, where are your headlights yeah. going? Like figure yeah. that out. And, and it's kind of the eye thing. It's like where your eyes going, your whole body's going to follow. Your and body if your body, yeah. And I think that's yeah, your body goes with, yeah, your eyes. So where you take, take your, that's why I say going in the second barrel, when you barely move your hand, you look to the outside ear, it just took my body there. I've got this horse blocked off over here. It's like, we're not turning yet. I'm holding you. Yeah. And now when I point my thumb a little bit, and open the inside of my body up a little bit, now you can come in here. Mm -hmm. So it kind of blocks them off is what it does. You're just blocking yeah. them with your hip, shoulder, because your eyes are looking over there. So it brings your, your hips and shoulder and your whole body that direction. Yeah. I love yeah. that. It's so subtle but so effective yes. and that's where you could probably do a run and people are like, it looks like you're doing nothing, but it's like, you are yeah. doing a lot, but it doesn't have to, like you said, power steering. It could be that easy. Like it can be that, yeah. that discreet because we know horses feel everything. Like they're so touchy, but yet wow. we feel like we need to use so much force and brace to get this <laughs> response from them. But I think going back to what you said, it's like a, a human problem that we feel we have to do that. That we well, feel like you're right about that. And I, and sometimes I look at people and I'm not being ugly, but I look at people and go, man, if I was in a stall and they were coming out to ride me and torture me again, I do like Ray Hunt said, I just turned into the bronc of the year <laughs> because you look at humans sometimes and they can have a very bad attitude and they were mad at the horse from the day before because they didn't get what they wanted out of the horse. They're like, Oh, that horse is going to get it tomorrow. And that's when I say, no, you need to sit down and think about maybe you need to get it. Maybe you need to see what you're doing. Because mm -hmm. I tell people, if you keep getting on horses and they're doing the same thing wrong and you're having problems, you need to look at yourself because you're carrying that into that horse. Yeah. And that's something I had to learn. Uh, that one time I thought it was a horse. My mom, no, it's not the horse that you. Yeah, horses, they challenge you some. Some are easy to train. Some are hard. But a horse is very basic. And if you just put great ba basics on them, they usually come around pretty easy because you're not requiring so much. Humans, mm -hmm. you know, since they could control computers, car, humans micromanage everything. Well, you can't do that with the animal. It's mm -hmm. just, it just doesn't work, mm -hmm. you know? 
And so the more anger you carry with you, the more that horse is going to carry. Yeah. So you're, it's just all feeding into it. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I did want to go back on is just, you said about the energy, the horses feel your energy and how you're uh -huh. approaching it. So can you break that down a little bit more of just the importance of how you show up and how that affects your horses? How you show up like at a barrel race or, or let's say training or just like being intentional with your energy, having like, and even going to the example of questioning things or looking to God for answers or looking really within yourself for those answers. Can you talk a little bit about that and just how important that is for your training? Well, I tell everybody at the clinics, first of all, if you've, if you've been in an argument with somebody or you're in a bad mood or something, just stay away from your horse until you get some of that stuff worked out. You know, if you're having a bad day, don't take it out on the animal because it's just going to create more problems and you're going to get more frustrated. So when I go out around the horses and stuff, I try to be, everything's got to be kind of like peaceful. Like kids, when kids go out around horses, their attitude is, oh, we get to ride and they're happy, right? Adults sometimes not so much. They get so into training and having this image and stuff that it becomes a miserable thing then. And so I tell everybody, just be more like a kid. Go out there and enjoy it, you know? have that kind of attitude and, and don't have carry all the anxiety and the problems with you out there. Cause kids don't have problems. They just, mm -hmm. they let their parents are dealing with them, you know, really in life. I mean, kids have a few, but when it comes time to riding their horses, they kind of forget about them. They're like, I'm out here with the horse. They just cleared their whole mind out because I'm fixed. I'm going to have fun and, and, you know, be with my horse and get to run barrels and to heck with everything else. Whereas adults don't do that. Adults go out there and they continue to think about, daily life and all the things and i've got 10 more horses to ride i gotta hurry up and ride this one well then don't ride so many mm -hmm. don't ride so many horses yeah. if, if you're if it's frustrating you that bad take less horses and spend more time with yourself and with that horse because i'm saying this because i've been through it before and that's how i learned how to deal with it uh, sometimes we just try to get too much going on in life and you just can't handle everything so then mm -hmm. just riding a horse becomes hard at that point mm -hmm. yeah it's true. And having that balance for sure with everything you do in life, I think, and setting your setting you and your horse up for success. I also believe of it starts with you, like how you are presenting the situation. And even as far as going, you said earlier of like just in a spiritual sense, because I really think horses are a gateway for that for us of they can be such a mirror and a teacher for us if we allow it and they can show us just like maybe our own weaknesses or things we need to work on and looking for the looking at the horses in that way of hey like what can this teach me today instead of like I'm going to teach my horse and I want to get xyz done I feel like it has such a different flavor to it and maybe yeah. people are really quick to be like we have to get this accomplished but they're missing kind of the whole point of what horses really bring us that's very true that's mm -hmm. very true and you can learn so much from the horse. Mm -hmm. And people always think, I got to teach the horse. Well, maybe you need to step back and let the horse teach you. Yeah. You know, like I said, the best ones I've trained, they just, I just kind of stayed out of their way. I just showed them the pattern and mm -hmm. all the correct things to do. And then I just let them show me what they needed from there. Of course, yeah, I have to tune them up once in a while. If they start cutting me off or not setting up for their turn to turn. I don't say right before a barrel. I just say setting up before the turn because mm -hmm. I need that transition to happen. Um, maybe they're not running. Maybe I need to just go breeze them out and take them off the barrels again, uh, you know, and, and just don't overwork your horse. Some people go, well, I don't work my horse on barrels at home. I'm like, yeah, but you're out there doing so many drills. The barrels might even be better because you're drilling your horse to death now. Over bending, over flexing, moving lateral, reverse arcs, all that stuff. I'm like, you can't do that every day to a horse because they're going to finally give up because mm -hmm. you take their heart out of them. Yeah. You can't, when they lose their heart, you basically lose the horse. Mm -hmm. You can't take that away from them. And also in that regard, it's kind of letting the horse move naturally how they're going to, because in a barrel race, they're naturally going to move in ways. And you said it earlier about using split reins versus your running reins. And I find uh -huh. that such a good concept and something that maybe people need to think about because I, I will go into my running reins and I train a lot in my running reins for futurity horses uh -huh. because I know when I go to split reins versus that, it's a totally different feel. And I ride oh, better okay. in my gaming reins, like my running reins, because it's like 
balance. I have more alignment with me because I can't rely on the reins to do everything. And, you know, you see people, maybe they train a certain way, or let's say an example being they use like draw reins in their exhibitions Uh and then they go do their run and their running reins. And it's like, right. To me, like, what do you think about that? Like, or even like training aids, like, do you think there's a time and place or are you for or against? Again, you got to think about what it's doing to the horse's mouth. You know, these people go, I don't use a tie down. I'm like, no, but you've got draw reins on and you're tying your horse's jawbone down. And so when you bruise up the bars of their mouth, you get their jawbone sore. And we deal with that at the clinic. So I've had horses that are, there's so much stress and anxiety I'm like, this horse needs the bit took off. And I've got a hackamore that I kind of designed um, to help for horses like that. It's very lightweight, but it gives you, it gets the horse to set on their back end and really turn nice. It doesn't have a lot of movement to it. That's why I'm saying I designed it because so many of these hackamores, they move everywhere and these horses are like, what? So they're scared of them. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I do that because these horses are in so much pain with their jawbone from being pulled on. Their bottom jaw is so bruised up, then they get TMJ, which goes in the pole, then which goes into the whole body. So if you've got their mouth that restricted, they probably don't want to turn the barrel because they're hurting just from you. Like I tell people, you go to the dentist, do you know how bad like a tooth pulled? Or one kid told me when I explained it to her, a kid told me, she goes, that's how my mouth felt when I got braces. She goes, it hurt. I said, it's the same thing. When you tie the horse's jawbone down with draw reins or you've got a big heavy bit and the bit's too tight in their mouth, I've always been the person you just touch the corners of the mouth, no smile, two fingers under the curb chain. I've never pulled a bit up tight in the horse's mouth. Mm -hmm. And I had a bit maker tell me one time, he said, the good concept is tell people put jeans on too tight. When you wear your jeans too tight, it's some point you're going to have to undo them because they're going to start bothering you. When you mm-hmm. put a bit in a horse's mouth too much, too tight, that's kind of the same concept. But then mm-hmm. when it's too tight and you're pulling on the jawbone, now you're double. I mean, everything's going to start escalating. Bits that are too heavy. Um, at the clinics, people come out there. They're going to work in this real heavy bit doing their slow work. I said, that might you might be able to get away with running with that, but that bit is that has so much weight in it. That horse's bottom jaw is so bruised up. This horse isn't going to want to come in the arena before long. Well, I got to go get his hawks. I said, it's not the hawks. I said, the horse is hurting in its bottom jaw because this bit is laying on it and it's bruised up. You can take the bit off and the horse is like, they take this huge breath. So we'll either put a little lightweight stabilizer bit of mine on or I might try the little hack more if if their mouth is really bruised. And the horse has completely changed. I mean, all the anxiety has gone. They're not chomping anymore. They're not so mad. It's like people go, well, I never thought about that. And I go, well, just think about carrying that much weight in your mouth, how you would feel. Or if somebody right. tied your mouth, If you, I tell people, if you would not do that to yourself, don't do it to the horse. Mm-hmm. So I said, I'm to the point, I feel like getting a pair of spurs and gouging people with them and go, mm-hmm. now, how does that feel, right? Go do it to yourself. Now, why are you doing it to your horse? Yeah, mm-hmm. I use spurs at, at the right time. If I need to get a little speed out of a horse, I'll use a real light rowel spur, but I don't train with them and poke on them all the time. I teach them to move off my energy and my body, mm-hmm. basically. And I might get a little bat and pop them once in a while and go, get moving. Don't come over here because this is what's going to be waiting for you. So I intimidate them a little bit, but no, I'm not abusive. I don't spur them. I don't tie their mouths down. I will use a tie down. I call it a nose balancer, basically, to teach them. When I pick my hand up, just hold your nose still. I don't need you flipping it up in the air telling me, oh, Mm -hmm. well, I'm just going to be a brat today. Okay, so I'll do something about it. But I'm not going to tie their mouth down if they're flipping their nose. I'm like, that doesn't even make any sense. So humans even confuse me. The things I see, what they do to horses, I'm like, now I'm confused because why are you doing that? You know, mm-hmm. that doesn't even make sense. Cause now you're going to make another problem on top of the problem you got. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I love that. Just yeah. thinking of not doing something to a horse that you wouldn't want done to yourself. Simple concept, yeah. but something to really, I think, keep in mind when people get in fights with their horses, even at a barrel race, like I see it sometimes of really fighting with their horse. And then right before the run, it's like, I already know how their run's going to go based yeah. on the energy. Exactly. Based on like the energies and also just 
like, yeah, like the demeanor behind it. And I guess maybe people can start realizing, would I want to be treated this way? Am I actually understanding the animal? And if you can say yes, which I don't think you could, then continue on. Right. But for the most part, it's like you have to have that accountability. Um, yes, yeah, you do. Yeah. There's one other question that I wanted to talk about because you do a lot of clinics now. And I think clinics are amazing for just, you know, traveling all over. I think you can, you're can. you helping so many people and so many horses with your knowledge and wisdom. Your clinics are called No Excuses. Can you tell us right. a little bit? about what that means for you well again we you know we're always talking about when we talk to someone they'll always make an excuse first thing they're why why it's not happening mm -hmm. and so when you first thing you do is you make an, a no excuse like we say no excuses and and my friend natasha she uh kind of came up with that logo she said because people every time we say something they'll have an excuse for what they do and so natasha coordinates my clinics and and does an amazing job for me and helps me out a lot. And she, so that's kind of what had, how that evolved. And so every time somebody says something, you're making an excuse. You need to be aware of that. Don't make an excuse. Try to find a solution to it and fix the problem and do something about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like so that. That's Just, why we. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you say no. it has to do with like accountability as a rider? Yes. And as a winner, you're not going to make it excuses you're going to find a solution you're going to fix it because every mm -hmm. time you make an excuse you're coming up with a reason why you can't win yeah. you know you're justifying it basically and it's like i don't want to justify why i can't win i want to go figure out a way to win so mm -hmm. i'm not going to make an excuse for not winning anything mm -hmm. well i didn't feel good today or my horse i think i got to get my horses the hawks injected i hear that so much and i'm like my mom goes how did years ago all these horses run and get hauled for millions of years and and all of a sudden now you got to have injections and everything How, how's this happening you know yeah there's a time and a place for injections have i ever done them no even on my top-notch horses never did i ran them correctly i had a great shoer my mm -hmm. tack all fit good and i kept my weight and balance correct i think when you throw something the weight and balance into it you're going to soar a horse up real quick mm -hmm. and i don't like square toe again square toes are for a time and a place horse's foot is round my horse's feet stay round i'm not putting square toes on them my fastest horses i've ran you know high 16s on standard patterns they had round toed shoes on mm -hmm. they go well they're going to break over quicker well i know people that's done that and guess what they broke broke over quicker and broke their horse's front end down can't mm -hmm. run them anymore so mm -hmm. you got to be real careful with all these fads and trends and things yeah yeah, yeah. there's I'd a ton of them Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. And that even goes back to what we said about different training concepts online. And then eventually, like, hey, I don't even know what to do anymore because there's so much yeah. information where I think what you said is a good point a while a little earlier is just about listening to the horse. First right. and foremost, keeping it natural what the horse yeah. naturally is ability, like keeping it just so simple and natural for them that there's no room for those breakdowns because you're allowing the horse to work how it naturally is intended to and you're yes. in a way you're just teaching it to do a job but you're not interfering with its natural movement and just natural tendencies as a horse like we're very much like respect the horse as it is and let's get the most out of that that particular horse, get it to use most effectively and efficiently as possible. And yes. I think that's a great thing. Yes. <laughs> and when a horse gets to the barrel, it ought to be fun. The turn mm -hmm. should be fun. You shouldn't be dreading it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're sure. dreading it, you need to change something. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, this was a really good conversation. I want to end it off with one final piece of advice or idea or concept that you would like more people to know what would it be one concept i would say straight lines every time you get in a bind just stop straighten your horse up and get them square on their feet and just stop and think about where you're at mm -hmm. and feel where those horses the footwork's going like if they're stepping out sideways or they're stepping in that's always been my my biggest thing my pet peeve is where's a horse stepping at where, where are they using their feet Mm -hmm. So I just stop, square them up, take a deep breath and go, now let's just track forward and see what's going to happen next. Okay, perfect. And now yeah. a piece of advice for, let's say, our mindset and just showing up as the performer and competitor that we want to be. Oh, something like my mom would say, you're here to win. 
you're not here to listen to other people's ideas and and put doubt in yourself mm-hmm. go out there and ride your horse the way you trained your horse and trust your training mm-hmm. yeah love it it's so short but so powerful and also yes. quite hard to, to it can be like that can be a full journey just to apply that but I think it is oh yeah nice and short and sweet and yeah very my awesome. mom was always good because if I went out and made a mistake or I did something kind of different she'd go why'd you do that and I'd say well such and such told me I ought to try it. <laughs> well, where are they at right after she got done chewing them out they didn't nobody come up and tell me to be trying different uh, maneuvers out there running the barrel pattern grab the outside rein on the back side of the first barrel to move over and get your horse straight and somebody mm-hmm. told me that one year at the NFR and I did that I tried it I'm like I don't know why I did it they they, they implanted my mind right so since it was there it just kind of happened oh did she get mad she mm-hmm. said who told you that and shoot them out and she goes if I want your advice I'll ask you for it otherwise keep your mouth shut Love and I it. tell people that all the time. Just keep your mouth shut. And don't talk about other people. Leave people alone. You yeah. know, go try to find somebody that can really, that really cares. That really yeah. cares. They're not out for themselves. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And also like with that, it's trusting yourself. Like don't take, maybe there's a balance of listening to other people and taking in advice, but also staying true to yourself of what you know is correct and not doubting going back to like the self doubt, not doubting yourself because someone gives you a different idea and then you doubt all your training. Cause it's like, then what yes. do you have to fall back on when something goes wrong? Then you don't even have yourself to fall back on. Cause now you're like, I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> So, right. And yeah. everybody has their own way of doing things. Mm-hmm. But you, my, I was taught you can't beat basics. Always go back to the basics when when you're stuck, you yeah. know, and yeah. you can learn something from everybody. It can be good or bad. Yeah. You're hoping it's good, you know, but sometimes just somebody's little word like Wanda Bush, trust your training, you know, mm-hmm. Dale Yuri, Um, He always said a winning barrel horse. It, it's just a runaway. Basically, they're mm-hmm. just a runaway horse that you're trusting your training with all that to kick in, yeah, you know, so people like that saying just little things like that, you're like, wow, they have that same feeling too. Yeah. Yeah. And that sounds fun. Thinking like your horse is a runaway and just trust it. Like that's that's like the fun thing that we like about barrel racing is being a little bit out of control, but it all just comes together. Like he said, a a controlled runaway. That's what he said. Controlled runaway, (laughs) want to push, trust your training. So yeah, so you can learn something from anybody, just a few little words like that. You're like, small words, but pretty powerful. Yeah. Very, very powerful. Definitely something to just ponder and think about a little bit deeper and how you can apply it. So yeah, this has been amazing for people listening that would like to learn more from you, maybe get in contact, figure out where your clinics are going to be so they can sign up. Where can they find you online? Oh, they can. uh, Well, I have a website, conniecombs.com or you can Facebook me, message me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, well, I just want to say thank you on behalf of myself and I'm sure all the listeners that this is incredible. And just thank you so much for taking the time to share some of your wisdom and knowledge that you've gained over the years and just keep You're it welcome. going. Keep that. And we also keep- have we also have our no excuses, Connie Combs, no excuses clinics page, and you can get okay. all the updates there with clinics and, and updates. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. No, no well, excuses, everybody. <laughs> yeah, no excuses get yeah. with the program right <laughs> whatever it, it yeah. may be yeah, yeah. yeah. even well, doing dishes no no dishes in the sink that was my dad no dishes left in that sink no excuses no right excuses mm-hmm. absolutely it's true yeah. so true park at the yeah. park at the farthest spot at the parking lot no excuses yeah no yeah as far out as you can and get your steps in for the day yeah, yeah. no excuses <laughs> Because people it. have a tendency to be lazy, you know, oh, people yeah. watch them and you're like, wow, they're getting lazy. Mm-hmm. Huh? Can't let yeah. yourself get lazy when you're doing this. Yeah. 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 And today's day and age, it's all, it's very easy to be lazy. So you really have to kick your own butt to yeah. do that. Cause like you said, even earlier yeah. to circle back is how you are in your day-to-day life is how you are as a performer and a competitor. So how do yes. you want to show up every day to let it reflect your performance in the arena? And I think just that mm-hmm. idea really give ourselves the accountability to show up every single day for ourselves in order to really perform how we want. So it's a, right. it's a lifelong journey, right? It is. Yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> 
Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. And maybe we'll do a part two because I feel like I still, there's still like a lot to talk about, I feel. And yeah, this was great. So uh, thank yeah, you so much. Just let me know and hopefully we can. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye.